Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds, and welcome to Video Notes for Topic 9.3, which is the greenhouse effect. Our objective for the day is to be able to identify the most important greenhouse gases from an environmental standpoint, but then also to be able to describe the difference in their potency or their ability to warm our climate. So before we talk about the actual greenhouse effect, we need to understand a little bit about solar radiation and the different things that can happen when the sun's rays are headed towards Earth. So first, I want to point out that not all solar radiation will actually reach Earth's surface. So this diagram is really helpful for helping us understand, again, what are the different possibilities or the things that can happen with the radiation that's emitted by the sun? So first of all, about a quarter of all incoming radiation is going to be reflected right back out into space by the atmosphere and by the clouds. And so we can see that demonstrated here. Again, about a quarter of that incoming radiation will hit a cloud or hit some sort of gas molecule in the atmosphere and it'll just be bounced right back out into outer space. Then we have about 20% that's going to be absorbed by the atmosphere and by clouds. And when it's absorbed, think of it as the energy kind of entering that cloud or that molecule, it, it absorbing or taking it in momentarily. And then it's going to radiate it right back out. It's going to give it off. And so we can kind of see that effect happening here where the radiation that's hit clouds again or gases in Earth's atmosphere will take it in momentarily and then it will radiate some of it out to space and some of it back down to Earth. And then what's left of that incoming solar radiation is going to reach Earth's surface. And then there's two things that can happen when it hits Earth's surface. So it can hit Earth's surface and be absorbed or it can hit Earth's surface and be reflected. And so if it's absorbed, it's going to be given off as infrared radiation. And if we look at this portion right here, we can kind of understand this idea. Solar radiation hits Earth, and if it hits a surface with low albedo, uh, meaning that it absorbs a lot of it, it will give it off as infrared radiation. And we'll be focusing more on this on the next slides as well. But the amount of sunlight from Earth that is either absorbed or reflected depends on albedo. So remember that if we have darker low albedo surfaces, so these could be things like dark, deep uh, ocean waters, or exposed soil or blacktop, if we're talking about the urban heat island effect, they're going to absorb sunlight and then give off infrared radiation. Lighter albedo surfaces, on the other hand, which could be things like snow or polar ice caps, they're going to reflect sunlight. So they're not going to absorb very much and they're going to send those rays right back out into space. And again, if we look at our handy diagram here, we can kind of see this idea that a high albedo surface will reflect uh, light right back out into outer space. And so that's going to leave Earth's atmosphere. So now we'll take a look at the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is this idea that there are gases in Earth's atmosphere, and those gases trap heat and radiate it or send it back down to Earth. Now, the greenhouse effect gets kind of a bad rap in environmental circles sometimes, uh, but it's important to point out that without the greenhouse effect, there would be no life on Earth. The planet would just be too cold. We wouldn't be able to support water in a liquid state on much of Earth's surface, and so we wouldn't have any life on Earth without it. So it's really important and it's really critical. The problem is that it's a really delicate balance, and we'll talk about what I mean by that uh, coming up here. Let's take a look at how it works, though. Like I mentioned earlier, you can kind of think of it as this blanket of gases around Earth's surface. But we have to understand, first of all, where does the heat that the greenhouse effect traps come from? So that heat's going to come from the sun. So if we take a look at this diagram, there are solar radiation, uh, solar rays, excuse me, coming in. And so that's going to be UV light. It's going to be visible light. And what happens is when it strikes Earth's surface, it's converted to infrared radiation. Now we can't see infrared radiation, but we can experience it as warmth or as heat. And so the Earth's surface, when it gets hit by sunlight, is going to give off that infrared radiation. If we look at this part of the diagram, we can see these red uh, light waves, which represent infrared radiation. They're radiating or coming off of Earth's surface. And this is where the greenhouse effect comes into play now. The greenhouse gases just refer to gases that can absorb that radiation. So here's a molecule of CO2. It absorbs infrared radiation. It basically takes that energy on briefly for a second, but then it's going to radiate it right back down towards Earth's surface. Now, it's important to point out that it also radiates out away from Earth's surface. But when we talk about the greenhouse effect, what we're referring to is specifically the portion of infrared radiation, which remember humans feel this as warmth or heat. We can't see it. But it's going to be radiated back down towards Earth. And that portion of the infrared radiation is what we refer to as the greenhouse effect. So as a really quick recap, because this is so critical, visible and UV light comes in from the sun, strikes the Earth's surface. 
it changes to infrared radiation and Earth's surface gives off that infrared radiation, which we feel as heat. And that infrared radiation, infrared radiation hits greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, water actually is a greenhouse gas. We'll talk about that shortly, methane among some others. And the portion that's radiated back down towards Earth is what we refer to as the greenhouse effect. And this is why Earth is warm enough to support life, but it's also why adding more greenhouse gases can make Earth a little bit too warm. So we'll get into that here shortly. Now we'll take a look at different greenhouse gases and their sources. So we have a diagram here, the same one as before, to help us remember what those greenhouse gases do. The first one we'll talk about is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is probably the most critical because it's being admitted in by far the greatest amount. But we'll talk about how it actually kind of serves as a benchmark or the gas by which we measure all other greenhouse gases relatively here on a second. Major sources of carbon dioxide are fossil fuel combustion, of course, uh, decomposition of organic matter gives off some carbon dioxide. Deforestation is going to lead to net carbon dioxide release. Remember that trees can't sequester carbon dioxide after we cut them down. Uh, then we have methane. So methane comes from natural gas extraction. It comes from natural gas combustion. It's also going to come from something called anaerobic decomposition. So remember, that's the breakdown of organic matter, especially in low oxygen conditions like underwater. Uh, so bogs and wetlands can give off some natural methane through their decomposition, uh, but especially in the permafrost as well. So that's this permanently frozen area, uh, you know, really high latitudes on Earth. And so that's going to basically lead to the breakdown of organic matter underneath pools of water as the permafrost thaws. So that's a big methane uh, contributor. Then we have nitrous oxide. So don't confuse this with NOx. It's different. Uh, this is not nitrogen oxide. This is nitrous oxide. So that's N2O. Remember the big source globally, about three quarters of all nitrous oxide emissions come from the management of agricultural soils. So what do we mean by the management of agricultural soils? Well, what that really means is basically adding nitrate fertilizers to soils and then the natural denitrification that happens, especially in over fertilized and over watered soils. So again, in those anaerobic conditions, nitrifying bacteria are going to take those excess nitrates and convert them in some cases into N2, but in other cases into nitrous oxide. And so that is the main contributor globally to nitrous oxide. Then we have CFCs. So think back to 9.1 and 9.2, where we talked about CFCs and really the entire class of compounds that they encompass. Um, they're going to be greenhouse gases as well. Then one final thing that we need to point out here is that water is by definition a greenhouse gas. So water absorbs infrared radiation when it's in the atmosphere and it emits it back down to earth. But it's not a greenhouse gas that we're particularly concerned about. And here's why. With all of these other greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, uh, CFCs and nitrous oxide, they are non-condensable. So what that means is as the temperature in Earth's atmosphere changes, they don't condense into liquid and leave the atmosphere. But water does. So remember that water is dependent, or I should say the amount of water the atmosphere holds is dependent on a temperature, not the other way around. So again, what I mean by that is as Earth gets cooler, as the atmosphere gets cooler, as you rise in the troposphere, it's eventually going to get too cool to support more water vapor. That water vapor is going to condense and fall down to Earth. So we can't just pump more and more water into the atmosphere because water in the atmosphere is dependent on its temperature. Whereas all of these other gases, as you add more and more of them to the atmosphere, they stay there and they influence Earth's atmosphere temperature, not the other way around. So one final time with respect to water here, the Earth's atmosphere temperature influences the amount of water it holds, not the other way around. With carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, CFCs, and methane, they influence Earth's atmosphere temperature. You add more of them, they don't condense and leave, they stay there and they increase Earth's atmosphere temperature. All right, and the final thing we'll talk about today is the potency of each greenhouse gas, or what we call sometimes it's global warming potential, potential, or it's GWP. So this is basically a measure of how much a given molecule of gas could contribute to the warming of Earth's climate, or atmosphere specifically, over a 100-year period. Now, there's something important to point out here. It's all relative to CO2. So we've basically taken the global warming potential of CO2, set it equal to one, and then we're measuring every other greenhouse gas as a fraction, or really as a multiplier, I should say, of carbon dioxide. And so global warming potential really comes down to two factors or two characteristics of a gas. The first one is residence time. So how long does it stay in the atmosphere? And the second one is infrared radiation. 
how good is it at absorbing infrared radiation and re-emitting that radiation back down to Earth? Different molecules have different structures due to the way that their atoms bond. And so this is going to give rise to this property where, again, some molecules absorb a lot of infrared radiation and radiate it back down to Earth, and some don't absorb nearly as much. So let's take a look at each of these four major greenhouse gases now. So remember that we have carbon dioxide, and we're going to set its greenhouse or its global warming potential equal to one. So there's not really anything to dive into here. We just should know that carbon dioxide is equal to one. Next, we'll take a look at methane, which remember is CH4. Methane stays in the atmosphere for around 12 years, so that would be its residence time. And then it's going to absorb a fair deal more infrared radiation than carbon dioxide. And so depending on the time span that you measure it, methane can have anywhere from a 23 times uh, the global warming potential to 84 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide. So remember what that means is that one molecule of methane would warm the earth about 23 times as much as one molecule of carbon dioxide over a 100 year period. Next we have nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is gonna have a pretty long residence time which is on average 115 years. And so that's gonna to contribute to its, its global warming potential. But we also have the fact that it absorbs a lot more infrared radiation than carbon dioxide. And so we give it a global warming potential of 300. So again, that means one molecule of nitrous oxide, we would expect to warm Earth's atmosphere about 300 times as much as one molecule of carbon dioxide. And then finally, we have CFCs. And CFCs are gonna be uh, really greatly ranging in their global warming potential because they are so diverse as a class. But what we should know is that they stay in the atmosphere for 50 to 500 years, so they can have an extremely long residence time. And their global warming potential, because they absorb so much infrared radiation, is going to be anywhere from 1,600 to 13,000. Uh, and so you don't need to memorize these numbers, but you do need to be aware of how much more warming a molecule of CFCs would be compared to a molecule of carbon dioxide. And finally, for our practice FRQ for 9.3 today, we're going to practice this skill of explaining environmental concept. So I want you to try explaining how greenhouse gases in the atmosphere contribute to the warming of Earth's climate, but then also identify a greenhouse gas with a global warming potential greater than one and explain why it has a global warming potential greater than one. 